Hello everyone this is part 20 of what if Naruto traveled back in time and changed, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Join my membership the perks are great, it's in the description. The training group left Kirigakor after six months in the beautiful mist-covered country. Mei pouted petulantly that without Naruto there she wouldn't be able to have more dates with Guy. The training group laughed at that, and soon it said that Mei should make him Kanoa's ambassador to wave, then she could see him regularly. That cheered the s, fiery redhead up and she waved goodbye to the group of shinobi. Zabuza could be seen fighting back tears as Haku hugged him passionately. It was finally time for Zabuza to give Haku up and Naruto was going to take her to wave and let her settle down with Himawari. The way Naruto saw it, this would let her bond with family, and she would be a strong defender of wave when the Senju family was absent. Back to the crying demon, Zabuza felt like he was losing the part of himself that remained human, but on the other foot he felt like this was Haku's chance to gain independence and decide what she wants in life. Mei was truly grateful for Naruto and the Senju family. In six months, Naruto had helped most of Kiri recover. Sure, it was strange for Kiri to have a bunch of wood houses when most of the houses were made of brick or some other form of stone. That being said, the houses Naruto made were selling like hotcakes since everyone wanted to live in a house built by the Senju prodigy. In addition, Mei felt more secure than ever in her home country. The protective seals and barriers Naruto installed were a great relief to a country that was torn apart by war for over a decade. The humidity control seal was also useful in the storage of foods and other dry goods that would be damaged by the moisture. In addition, Naruto gave me a sampling of braziers and thongs with the pain relief and anti-rape seals on them. In summary, Mei Terumi loved the Senju boy and the people of Kiri tended to agree with her. You take care of my girl, brat, or I will find a way to end you. Zabuza growled. Naruto waved him off, hi, hi. I get it, Zabuza. You have my word that Haku will be happy, healthy and cared for. She isn't my prisoner, she isn't my servant, and she isn't bound to me. I only ask that she meet her aunt and give Wave a chance. It would be fine, Zabuza. Haku said in a soft reassurance. Zabuza's growl sounded wet, and his eyes were misty as he gave Haku one last hug goodbye. The influential people from Kiri watched on in amazement as Naruto flashed into his Kurama Sage mode, KSM for short, and flashed the group away. Naruto had grown strong enough to enter KSM for short bursts and he used that ability to perform his long-distance Horatian jump with the training group. This group travel left everyone seriously disoriented, and they wouldn't agree to it if it didn't save them over a week of travel. Before the disorientation could be shaken off, Naruto was tackled to the ground by two blonde blurs. He looked at the radiant and smiling faces of Ino and Temari, both of whom were looking more beautiful than ever to Naruto. Six months apart wasn't fun even when they could communicate every night. Soon it had forbidden him from traveling back saying that they were on the trip to train and help people, not have a vacation. After Mama put her foot down, the triple ceased their protests and accepted Sunid's decision. Therefore, the three blondes were starved of each other's affections, and they refused to let each other go. After a while, the three lovers broke their hug and Naruto took a good look at the loves of his life. Temari was as beautiful as ever and Naruto noticed a couple unique streaks of aqua blue flowing through her blonde hair. It was unique, sensual and exotic for Naruto to see. Temari had matured a little bit with her face slimming out a little bit and her teenage beauty seemed to be more mature and womanly. As always, Naruto thanked Kami for this blonde bombshell. A few seconds later, Naruto looked over to Ino and she looked radiant, as if the pregnancy was making her glow. That's right, the baby. Naruto offered Ino a quick K before he paid homage to the beautiful baby bump. Ino blushed and Temari watched on with a graceful smile on her face as Naruto fawned over Ino and asked all the questions he had written to the girls over the past few months. After praising the baby bump and Kei it a couple times, Naruto soaked in the beautiful blonde goddess in front of him. Ino had matured a little with her face becoming more angular, which made her girly beauty seem more graceful, mature and elegant. 
She had grown a couple inches taller, and she was wearing a purple maternity dress that let her long, lustrous legs enjoy the cool sea breeze. Kami, you are the best for giving me these two. Thank you. Naruto offered a quick prayer of broad to the goddess that had given him a second chance. How long do we have until you are due? Naruto asked excitedly. Ino sighed, Ruto, the answer is the same as yesterday when you asked by scroll. It is due in three weeks. Temari chuckled, torn between jealousy and adoration of the man that would do anything to protect his family. Ruto, relax, your baby boy will be here soon enough. Why don't we go inside and get reacquainted with one another? She finished in a sultry tone and wiggle of the eyebrows. Eno pouted, no fair. Temari giggled and grabbed Eno's hand, hey girl, just cause you're pregnant doesn't mean you can have fun. Own man has a tongue and lips girlfriend. Eno smiled at that, maybe this would be fun. Lead the way, Mari. Gimme a sec. I have to let the loony bin out. Naruto said sarcastically as five wood clones sprouted out of his back. Rias gave a quick hug and K to each girl before darting off and looking for Anko and Kushina. Hikari squealed excitedly and hugged both girls enthusiastically before waving goodbye. Yosuke offered his heartfelt broad and consideration to each of the girls before running off to find Himawari and Suya. Haku followed Yosuke because she wanted to meet Himawari and find her place in Wave. Yami nodded to the two girls before skulking off somewhere, which made the group chuckle. Kurama offered a hug and a chakra blessing to Ino and her child. It was a kitsune thing and it seemed to help and invigorate Ino. Gara and Hanata stayed behind for a minute to say hello to their friends and family. Gara paid special attention to Ino, who he already considered a sister. It was touching when everyone saw Gara's face soften as he cradled Eno's belly tentatively. The couple offered a graceful goodbye before they tucked into some nook of the Senju villa to enjoy some alone time. The three blondes remained locked in Naruto's bedroom for the rest of the day. Eno discovered the kinky joys of LS and the complications it can cause. Temari relished in the stamina and prowess of her man while Eno participated intermittently. The night found the trio tangled in a loving mess on Naruto's bed. They each wore contented grins as they rested peacefully in each other's arms. Three weeks later, birthday. For the past week, as Eno's due date approached, many Konohans were present in Wave Country once again. Anoiki and Lena had been in Wave for almost two weeks now and they were, Mother Henning, over Eno. Anoiki's anger at Naruto had abated and now he was excited for his grandson and concerned for his daughter. Pregnancy at a young age always carried risks, but Anoiki found comfort in the presence of two of the best medics in the elemental nations. Atachi also dispatched squads 9, 10 and a couple Anbu squads for security to wave. In his stead, he allowed his mother, Mikoto, and Shisui to go to wave for added security as well. Atachi knew that this was a high-risk pregnancy, and not just because Ino was young. He had kept everything under wraps, but if Iwa were to hear about Naruto having a child, then Wave could become a war zone. He had also instructed Anoiki and Lena to keep it quiet as well for the same reason and they both readily complied with that order. Hyashi, Hanabi and Neji arrived in Wave and were enjoying a week-long vacation while helping out the Senju family wherever they could. They were each informed about the pregnancy and given a protection mission during their time on the island. Hyashi wanted to spend time with Hanata and he felt like he owed the Senju family greatly. Therefore, he was more than willing to patrol Wave Country with Neji and Hanata. The Byakugan was an exceptional tool when it came to scouting and defending a fixed location. The ever-excitable Squad 9 was helping Wave's SDF forces with patrols. They weren't exactly the stealthiest, so they pulled security at the bridge and ports. They would also be assigned to hospital security during the birth and subsequent time in the hospital. There were strict lockdown plans, multiple barrier defenses and screening seals set up at the hospital. They would be screening each patient entering and visitors would be denied for a couple days. Team 10, mainly Shikamaru, Asuma and Chuji, were also assigned to hospital security. Shikamaru began running worst case scenarios, infiltration routes and he found gaps in the security to plug up. He took the duty super seriously and banished his laziness until the baby was safe in the Senju villa. Ino was one of his closest childhood friends and Naruto was one of his best friends, despite being a troublesome bastard that made him work out every day. 
The love of his friends was the only motivation that Shikamaru needed to put his best foot forward. Shisui was the Anbu commander, despite only Atachi and the Anbu captains being aware of that. He was Atachi's right hand and most trusted person in Kanoa. He was also one of two remaining Uchihas that knew that Naruto was part of the neighborhood watch. He, Fugaku and Mikoto were surprised when Naruto asked him to sign a blood contract and found out that he was the Kanoa agent for the organization. They all felt a debt of broad to him and Shisui wanted to pay his debt forward. Shisui brought Team Ro and Team Haka. Team Ro had the highest overall success rate and Team Haka specialized in asset and fixed position defense. Shisui also felt indebted to Naruto, and he felt doubly so because of his shameful village's treatment of the Senju heir. Shisui wasn't naive, he knew exactly what would have happened if Naruto didn't intervene and stop the Iwa and Sound armies. Furthermore, Shisui could still close his eyes and watch the miracle Naruto performed due to his photographic memory with the Sharingan. All in all, Shisui was more than happy to help Naruto and his family. Shino didn't know how to feel about Naruto. Of course, he loved the guy, and he was ever grateful to him. However, after Hanata joined the training trip, he was made to be the team leader of Team 7 with Kiba and Sakura. Thus, he was incredibly fed up with Team 7 and Kakashi's chronic lateness. He managed to whittle down Kakashi's lateness by threatening his, Ika Ika, series with his Kikaichu bugs, but that was a small concession considering he still had to put up with the Banshee and Dog Boy. Now, Shino was in wave with his father and mother, who insisted on coming along to support Naruto. Shino knew the Abarame could be trusted, and he confided in him about Naruto's firstborn son. He also brought Apata, who was now four feet tall with a humanoid body. Apata insisted on spending time with the man who named her, and she wanted to do her part in helping protect the man she called, at least in her mind, master. Thus, the main island of Wave Country was bustling with life, activity and Kanoa Shinobi. Naruto was glad to be surrounded by his friends, family and those he actually respected from Kanoa. He felt like he could take on the world with these people by his side and he was just getting settled into bed with Ino and Temari. How are you feeling, my love? Naruto asked the sleepy Ino. Ino replied in a sleepy, yet snide, mutter, the same as I was five minutes ago Ruto. I swear, I am going to ask Kuranai to put you in a genjutsu to make you feel what we women go through. Oh, oh, I would love to see that. Temari said excitedly as she rose over Ino and gave her a K goodnight. Naruto chuckled sheepishly as his two girls snuggled into him, yeah, I don't know about that one. Ino playfully slapped his chest, Barker, it would be the least you could do to show how much you love me. Naruto's chuckling turned into nervous laughter, ah, come on, Ino, you, you wouldn't do that to me, would you? Hmm, was Ino's muttered reply. Unknown location, it was strike team. Is everyone ready? Yes, Captain, we're ready. How are we getting into wave? Replied the second in command. Leader Sama hypnotized the boat captain. We will be smuggled into wave. Our intelligence said that the girl should be having the baby any day now. The captain answered. So, what if she hasn't had the baby yet? A junior golem asked. Then we wait until she has. Wave is a country of civilians with only minor forces. We will lay low, wait until the Senju demon goes home and then we will snatch and grab the baby. The captain answered confidently. Are we sure this information is good? Sounds a bit too easy. The lieutenant asked. This is coming from the top. That new organization always provides good intel. Now, no more stupid questions. It is time to move out. Wave Country, Senju Villa 430 Am. Naruto. Ino screamed. Naruto was instantly alert and on guard. Yes, Ino, what is it? He said as he rose out of bed. Ino calmed down a bit and shot an apologetic look at Temari. My water broke. Go get Sunad. Naruto gave a gleeful shout before quickly K Ino on the lips and running to get Sunad. As he left the room, he saw Shisui standing guard outside the door. He let them know what was going on and Shisui went to round up the troops. It was go time. Naruto ran to Sunid's room, knocked quickly on the door and didn't wait for the go-ahead to come in. Thus, Naruto got his first first-person view of Sunid's glorious rack as she rose out from the cover of her bedsheets while rubbing her eyes wearily. Kurama didn't even stir next to her until he heard Naruto's next words. 
Mama, her water broke. It is go time. Naruto shouted excitedly, not even taking a moment to appreciate the two beautiful works of Kami. Okay, brat. We will be out in a minute. Get her ready to go and we will go to the hospital in 10 minutes. Sunad answered in an alert tone. Congrats, Kit. Kurama offered with a cheeky grin. 30 minutes later, the Senju family was escorted into their hospital room and the hospital was set on high alert. At 5 a.m., teams 9, 10, Ro and Haka were all on guard and performing their perimeter sweeps. Kaisa stopped by quickly to congratulate Naruto and tell him that all of his people were ready to help him. Naruto offered his broad and ushered him out of the door as Sunid and Shizun took control of the birthing room. Unfortunately for Naruto, they ushered him out as well until Ino's labor was in progress. Ino said that she wanted Naruto there for the labor. Naruto went into the waiting room and saw Hyashi, Mikoto, Shisui, Hanabi and Shino sitting there waiting. His altars and their significant others hadn't shown up yet, but they would be there soon. He went through the round of greetings and hugs, and he left a clone with them. Naruto was too excited to sit still, and he needed to do something proactive otherwise he would drive himself insane. Naruto decided that a quick round of meditation would mellow him out and prepare him for the stresses of the labor to come. Naruto went to the roof of the Senju Memorial Hospital and sat in a lotus position on the rooftop garden. Shino had accompanied him and Apata was hovering over the garden soaking in the peaceful presence of Naruto's Senjutsu Chakra. Naruto played and synced with the natural energy before he slipped into sage mode. Naruto took it to stage 2 since he wanted to feel outwave and ensure that nobody had gotten past their security. Naruto's consciousness spread around the island and his chakra resonated with each member of the island. The truly miraculous thing about Naruto's sage mode was that the whole island danced with life and seemed more vibrant. The locals instantly recognized it as Naruto's presence and he could feel their auras greeting the tender sensation of his chakra. Naruto loved this feeling in wave because there was no fear, no rejection, no hostile intent, wait, why was there hostile intent? Naruto's eyes snapped open through his sage markings and Shino instantly rose from his leaned position on the wall. What is it, Ruto? Shino asked. Shino, go get Shisui and York, now. I am going to keep track of their presence. Naruto's tone was firm and commanding. Shisui darted off and Apata flew in front of Naruto, Master, how can I be of service? Naruto took in the humanoid bee and smiled gracefully at her, Ah, Apata, it has been too long. If you would go check the docks, warehouse 48. Just do a flyby and do not engage. I sense 12 people that don't belong and I don't want this day to be marred by death and destruction. Yes master. Apata replied gleefully before she flew off towards the docks. A couple minutes later, Shisui, York, Hyashi and Mikoto appeared on the roof. Since Shisui was the ranking officer, he asked the question. What is it Naruto? Naruto took a deep breath and brought his senses back into his body, Shisui, we have intruders down at the docks. I just sent Apata to scout. I sensed 12, but she will have more information. I can't tell you much, I can only tell you that I can feel their hostile intent and that they don't belong to Wave. It feels like they're laying in wait. York growled, they came into my country. Shisui put a calming hand on York's shoulder, relax, York. They don't know we know. If they came in one of the overnight boats, then they aren't likely to move until nighttime. We will wait for Apata to report back before we make a move. Naruto spoke up, Shisui, I want at least one of them alive. I want to know who sent them and how they knew. Are your eyes ready? Shisui didn't miss the meaning behind Naruto's words, so he only nodded. His left Koto Amatsukami had a long-term brainwashing effect, and his right eye had the power of hypnotic insinuation. Yes, Ruto, I will be on it. Naruto spoke up once more in a voice of forced calm, Shisui, this is a day of celebration. I don't want anyone in wave hurt. I don't want Ino to know this is happening. Can you do that for me? Shisui smiled confidently at Naruto, quick, quiet and clean. We will get it done. Lord Hyashi, can I request your assistance? Hyashi nodded proudly, you don't even need to ask. I was going to insist anyways. Take Hanata and Gara with you. Oh, and give Haku a chance to get in on this. She is excellent at assassination and incapacitating enemies. I will be the last line of defense and there is no way in hell I am going to let them near my family. 
Shisui put a calming hand on Naruto's shoulder, trust us, Ruto. We will get it done. You just enjoy your day with your wife. Naruto clasped one of his hands over Shisui's and gave it a squeeze, thanks, Shisui. Naruto walked back into the hospital while still in level 2 sage mode. His presence was overwhelmingly powerful up close and indoors, but Naruto wasn't going to lose track of the intruders. As he walked into the waiting room, everyone noticed his sage markings and saw the serious look on his face. It was Kurama that stood up first and spoke for the group. Kit, what's going on? Naruto weaved through seals in a blur before creating a privacy bubble over the waiting room, which put everyone on high alert. We have uninvited guests and I need to keep track of them and my friends who are going to risk their lives to deal with them. Kurama growled while Yosuke jumped to his feet and unsealed his katana. Rias put a calming hand on Kurama's shoulder and Himawari did the same for Yosuke. They dare come after my grandkids. Kurama bellowed despite the comforting presence of Rias and Naruto's Senjutsu Chakra. Naruto fixed his glowing emerald gaze on Kurama, Q, I need you to stay calm. Each of you is my last line of defense and I don't want Eno to know this is happening. Now, I am going to be by my fiancé's side, and I am going to send Sunid and Shizun out for you to inform them. Until this threat is neutralized, I am counting on each of you. Kurama forcibly calmed himself down and joined Hikari in giving Naruto a comforting hug. We got you, Kit. Nobody is going to touch our family. Naruto dropped the privacy dome and let the Senjutsu Chakra fade out. He took a deep, calming breath before entering the birthing room. Sunid instantly saw Naruto's face, which changed immediately before Ino looked over. He walked up and gave Sunid a hug and told her Q was looking for her. Sunid motioned to Shizun and the two left the room, which drew concerned looks from Ino and Temari. What's going on, Ruto? Temari asked. Nothing, I just wanted some time alone with the loves of my life. Mama said things are going well, how are you feeling Ino? Naruto replied, but his tone lacked its usual casual nature. Temari had an eyebrow, but she knew Naruto would tell her later. Ino growled at Naruto, you know mister, this is all your fault. This sucks. I am stuck like some lab experiment. I got juices leaking uncontrollably out of my Yahoo and I am cramping. You are totally going to go through a genjutsu to feel this. Naruto backed away sheepishly and chuckled nervously. Now, Ino, let's not say things we don't mean. Last I checked, it takes two to tango and you love dancing with me. Temari's stifled laughter only deepened Ino's growl. Look here, mister, you will do as I say or you won't get any. Naruto smiled cheekily at Ino, well, that's crazy. I don't know why you would punish yourself like that, but I guess I will support you through it. Temari burst out in laughter, this was the knucklehead she would love eternally because he always knew exactly how to make her feel better, he got you there, Ino. Ino pouted before her face contorted in pain and she went through a round of contractions. Gra, I am serious Ruto, if you love me, then you will feel my pain. And if you do that for me, I will give you as many kids as you want. Naruto sighed and relented, we can talk about it later princess, just focus on one thing at a time. Like your breathing, for example. Ah ah who. Naruto finished by making the exaggerated breathing noises that Sunid taught them. Before Ino could rip into Naruto, Sunid and Shizun came back into the room. Out, brat, I need to do some more checks. He can stay mama, it is nothing he hasn't seen anyway. Ino chimed in. No, he needs to go greet Raza, Pakura and Kankuro who came all the way up here. He offered his prayers and tells you to hang in there, by the way, Ino. Sunid's firm gaze told Naruto he should shut up and listen. Naruto and Temari K Ino on the forehead before leaving the room. Outside, Naruto could easily sense the first-gen shinobi of wave taking position on their floor as well as the floors above and below. Naruto walked out to see a clone of Sunid talking to Raza with a deadly serious look on her face. Naruto sighed, whoever the intruders were are going to pay big time for ruining his big day. Wave Country, Ushio Docks 12.30pm. Shisui, Team Rowan, Team Haka, Hyashi, Hanata, Gara, Shino, Shikamaru, Asuma and York were listening to a breakdown given to them by Apata. Sure, it was weird from them listening to a humanoid bee, but hey, there are crazier things out there. 
Shino had already let out the normal Kikaichu hive and the Senjutsu bugs to go and scout the warehouse in Apata's place. Okay, so I am Apata and I serve Master Naruto. It is nice to meet you all. Apata started awkwardly. Anyway, there are 12 guys in there and they are wearing red and black. No, Hishi 8. I am not much of a sensor, so I can't tell you much more about them. They are in a normal warehouse, and it seems like the leader is in the office on the southwest corner of the building. The others are lying low, but they are walking around inside. Shisui was nodding along and asked the first question Did you hear anything while doing your flyby? Apata nodded, It is hard to hear, but I picked up the words hospital, senju, demon, and baby multiple times. Gara growled and sand started swirling around him until Hanata placed a calming hand on his shoulder, a fact that wasn't missed by Hyashi. I will kill them all. Just the fact that Naruto has to worry about this on his special day is wrong. Shino stepped up, other than Hanata he was the closest to Gara. relax, friend, we will take care of it. Naruto requested at least one alive and he doesn't want to alert Ino or the civilian population. Shisui took charge once more, okay, who is proficient at assassination techniques? Asuma, Shino, the Anbu and Shikamaru raised their hands. Hmm, okay. Does anyone here know a good barrier we could use to trap them in the building and prevent things from escaping into the village? Gara spoke up, send for Kankuro. I can sense him, and he is the best at Fuenjutsu in Suna. With Naruto's notes, he is almost a seal master now. Shisui created a shadow clone that darted off to the hospital to retrieve Kankuro. Okay, Hugas, please keep an eye on our guests until we are ready to attack. Gara, you will lead Hyashi, Hanata and Haku as the second wave. The first wave of attack will be the Anbu and Asuma. York and Hyashi, you will coordinate things outside the barrier. Kankuro will only erect the barrier after we have engaged. Everyone nodded in understanding of their roles and the plan was issued once again when Kankuro arrived. Kankuro was furious that somebody dared to attack his family. He informed everyone that he would erect a lesser version of the four violet flames formation barrier. It was only lesser because it couldn't stand up to as much punishment, but it should be more than enough to contain these chumps. Team 9 was left as the first line of defense for the hospital and Neji was the spotter. Guy was in serious mode and the wave police were working alongside Team 9. The crowd that was beginning to gather for a vigil was a problem, but that was on the beach side of the hospital. That door had already been sealed and there should be no issues from that side. Guy Sensei, I still don't know who would do something so unyouthful. Lee said loudly, but he was surprised when he got a stern and disappointed look from his sensei. In a rare demonstration of Guy's inside voice, Guy spoke calmly and quietly to Lee. Lee, now is not the time to be loud and youthful. Now is the time to be quiet and serious to make sure that we are doing our job. Neji, how is the strain on your eyes? I am okay for now, Guy Sensei. It shouldn't be a problem until later on. Neji responded professionally. Neji always admired Guy's serious side. 1010, what extra defenses have you erected? Guy asked. Guy Sensei, I was asked not to add seals. Naruto already has the hospital covered. 1010 responded sadly. She really wanted the chance to apply her skills in the arts. She was the best of her generation in Fuenjutsu. Back at the docks, everyone was in position to eliminate the enemy threat. Kankuro had spread out four of his puppets that would anchor the barrier and all teams were ready to infiltrate. It was Team 1, the assassins, that entered first. They each snuck in and Team 2 wasn't to follow them in for at least one minute. At the minute mark, Kankuro would erect the barrier and make sure nothing escaped the battle zone. Inside the office of the warehouse manager, the captain was relaxing with his people. Laying low and incognito was all part of the job for an experienced shinobi. According to the ship captain, all of Wave will celebrate when the demon spawns her child. He was going to wait for that, then they would bide their time and assault the hospital. Would you guys relax? If they see you stomping around the place like sentries, then that will just draw more attention to us. The captain said. But Cap, ain't cha worried about the shinobi finding us. The captain laughed loudly, from what I heard, these guys just started training a security force. Ain't no second-rate ninja going to make me pucker up. Listen, newbie, laying low is part of the job description. But Kitsuki said that we should never let our guards down. Then don't let your guard down. 
Sit the F down, relax and spread your... The captain never finished his words due to the senven that was sticking out the side of his neck. Attack. One of the intruders shouted. As the captain was dying, teams Roe and Harker were able to neutralize four of the unwelcomed guests of Wave Country. That left at least seven left, which were pointed out by Hanata as she entered the fray alongside Gara. Gara roared as sand poured out of his seal and he released his and Shukaku's anger upon the intruders. Hanata had never seen Gara this made before, and it made her slightly squish her legs together as her panties soaked through. Gara's hand conducted the sand into javelins, needles, spears, arrows and all other sorts of pointy instruments that penetrated the thin boxes that the shinobi were hiding behind. Hanata simply remained by his side and pointed out the intruders as her Byakugan saw every single one of the intruders die. She gasped when she saw one of the intruders, a user of the explosion release bloodline, detonate himself. The explosion was massive and there was only a second in between Shisui shouting, take cover. And the explosion that detonated half of the warehouse. Gara's sand protected Hanata, Haku and Shikamaru who were close by. Kankuro hid himself in black ant. Shisui had cat with him in his Sasano. Bear had saved lion with an earth dome. All in all, it was scary as s, but the Conahan task force came out of it alive, if not with slight hearing problems. As the attack on the docks was happening, a big, white bird was flying over Ushio village. The bird was 200 meters up in the sky and the blonde man riding it was watching the scene play out through a monocle of sorts. He smirked as he saw one of his old explosion release comrades release his art upon the world. Sadly, unlike Deidre, that form of art was wimpy, and it was a one-use-only type of art. A white plant creature formed out of a spore on Deidre's neck, and it took a creepy-looking head shape. Well, Deidre senpai, that is that. There are too many shinobi present. Leader Sama said to abort the plan. Kissam cannot get through the barriers in the water surrounding the island without being detected. Hum, 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 that is no good. There was no art displayed here today. No screams, no blood nor terror either. Deidara answered the plant spore. Deidara senpai, Leader Sama does not want to simply enrage the QB Jinchuriki. If we could have captured the baby, then it would be worth it. Without a hostage, it would be unwise to agitate him. Is he really that bee? Deidara was cut off as a wooden arrow ripped through the head of his clay bird. What the F? Deidara shouted as he reached his hands into his clay pouches as he was free falling through the sky. Earlier, Naruto was in sage mode checking in on the battle and making sure that his friends were okay during the raid. He winced when he sensed the explosion, which caused the Kanoa team to panic quite a bit and one of them was injured. Realizing that everyone was going to be okay, Naruto spread his senses out and it was then that he sensed a chakra presence above the city. With a growl, Naruto realized who was flying above his city and spying. He activated his Mokuten abilities and did his best to shape it. A great bow formed in his hands, and he created a thin, yet powerful, vine to act as the drawstring. Channeling a healthy amount of chakra into a Mokuten arrow, Naruto released the arrow in the projected flight path of his target. The Senjutsu reinforced Mokuten arrow tore through the bird, and he was already forming another arrow. Naruto took aim and let loose. Deidara was calm despite only being 100 meters above the ground now, but he had his clay, and he could do this. That was when he saw another massive arrow tearing through the skies toward him. The Zetsu spore grew and pushed him out of the way, but not before the arrow ripped his right armor from the elbow down. With his left hand, Deidara summoned another, smaller clay bird that dipped and dived below a third arrow and flew off into the distance. Crazy blonde bastard. Deidara shouted as he piled a fistful of clay onto his bleeding wound to stem the bleeding. Hum, 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 I need to get the hell out of here. Naruto watched the bird fly away and couldn't suppress the growl that was escaping from his throat. That was his chance to eliminate one massive pain in the ass and he missed. Sure, it was a long shot, but it was still a clear chance to end one of his future opponents. Naruto felt a calming hand on his shoulder and turned to see Kurama looking at him with an understanding look. Kit today is a day for celebration. Your friends handled one threat and you just sent the other one packing. Now, Ino is almost done, so hurry to your mate. Kurama said in a soft and reassuring tone. Naruto hugged Kurama and darted back into the hospital. The Kitsune looked out over the horizon and made damn sure that the mad bomber wasn't coming back. 
With a sigh, Kurama followed his partner back into the hospital. Naruto skipped straight past the waiting room and gave the others an entertaining distraction as he scurried down the hall and back into the room with Ino and Temari. Naruto was glad Kurama recovered him from the roof, because he got a tongue lashing from Ino for almost missing the birth of his first son. Sure enough, five sets of contractions and ten minutes later Naruto-san let his first cry ring out in the land of the living. Soon it attended to Ino and began healing her while Shizune played her part as the midwife and tended to the baby. Naruto rested his crushed hand from Ino and placed a soft K on her tired and sweaty forehead. You did great, my love. You did great. Naruto whispered in her ear. Thanks, Ruto. Where is my boy? Ino asked tiredly. At that point, Shizune came over and placed the cleaned and swaddled baby on Ino. Congratulations you two. So, what are you going to name him? Naruto looked expectantly at Ino, who had made it very clear that she had the final say on baby names. Hashi Senju Uzumaki. Ino replied while looking lovingly at her baby boy and placing a K on his forehead. Naruto offered a gigawatt smile that brightened the room. I like it. In Kami's realm, a big, tall, goofy brunette man with long hair cried anime tears. This man was none other than Hashirama Senju that was recently released from Sasano's God of Drunken Dreams by order of Kami. The goddess got endless amusement from her previous chosen's antics and even more amusement from the stern overreactions from Mito Uzumaki. Kushina and Minato were crying in joy as they watched the birth of the first, or technically third, grandchild. Sniff, sniff, I can't believe, sniff, sniff, that they, that they named him after me, wah ha ha. Hashirama wailed in joy and broad before being bonked on the head by Mito. Hashirama Senju, this isn't about you. Today is about our great, great grandchild, you oaf. Mito shouted at him. My, my, it has certainly gotten lively at our viewing parties. Kami said while smiling and tapping her chin. Oh, relax, Kami-chan. They are family and you know you love it. Kushina said merrily. Minato smiled awkwardly at Kami, yeah, thank you for this opportunity, Kami-sama. It is more than we deserve. Kami shot a wry look at Kushina, even in the afterlife he is so formal. How did one as wild as you fall for someone so stiff? Minato had a rain cloud form over his head, and he pouted animatedly as Kushina laughed. Kami's realm celebrated the birth of the newest Senju Uzumaki, well all except for the Iwa viewers. They only ever tuned in for Naruto's fights and they only watched while hoping for him to be defeated. It was almost as if they didn't grasp the concept of Naruto's death literally meant the end of the world, again. Back in the hospital, Naruto was holding his son for the first time and soon it had shooed Naruto out of the room to give Ino some rest. Naruto walked into the waiting room where he saw everyone that was there to visit him. Anoiki and Lina were up front and smiling animatedly as they got the first look of their blonde-haired, blue-eyed grandson. Behind the two, Anko was holding Kushina and Himawari was holding Suya. Everyone, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce you to Hashi Senju Uzumaki. He said before bringing the baby over to his half-siblings. And this, little guy, these are your baby sisters Suya and Kushina. After a month, Kinji contacted Naruto and informed him that he had a couple experts ready to go to Azushiogakure and begin planning the resurrection of the fallen city. Naruto was excited to restore his home of origin and it would honestly be a nice fallback if Kanoa kept being a pain in his ass. Naruto was packing up and making sure they had everything they needed for three babies to join the trip. The girls insisted on coming and seeing the fabled land of the Uzumaki and Naruto was excited to show them. Sunad had mumbled and groaned about traveling with newborns, but she realized it was a futile battle. Her family was every bit as stubborn, tenacious and boneheaded as she was and she really didn't feel like beating her head against a wall. She reluctantly approved, but she insisted that Naruto would have to get them set up in the clan house before anything else was done. This meant that Tazuna was going to get drawn into the trip, which meant Tsunami, Kaisa, Inari and York were coming as well. Sunad swore that her family was going to become a band of traveling gypsies at this rate. As Sunad was packing her things in a scroll, she thought back to the first time she ventured to Azushiogakure with Naruto and Shizun. The long-awaited flashback. Naruto was eight years old, in this life, and he had requested to make the trip to Azushiogakure to visit his ancestral home and see if he could find any remaining pieces of his heritage. 
Soon it had put the trip off for long enough and knew that they should probably go now that everything in Wave Country and Ushio Village was properly set up. Thus, she got Kaiser and York to captain a boat across the whirlpools to the land of Eddies. The trip from Wave didn't even take a full day by boat but it was soon its first time disarming the whirlpool defences that still surrounded the island. Naruto wanted to find the security seals and attempt to replicate them for Wave, which would be a significant boost to the natural defences of Wave Country. That being said, the Wave group made it past the whirlpools safely and they landed on Azushio and set off to explore the land. Be careful everyone and stick together. There are multiple genjutsu barriers and other subtle defenses that will make you walk around in circles. Naruto said with his kitsune eyes active. Shizun, York and Kaisa, link up and do your best to routinely pulse your chakra. That is the only way to counter an area of effect genjutsu barrier. Soon it added as she put a hand on Naruto's shoulder. You should be fine, mama. According to my mom's journal, the barriers will only block out non-Uzumaki and you are at least one quarter Uzumaki. Naruto said. Not taking any chances, brat. Soon it settled the debate with finality. Thus, the Fivesome walked across the beach and into the jungle of Azu without properly knowing where they were heading. Naruto created 20 wood clones to go and scout the area as he led his family and friends through the dense, tropical jungle. It didn't take long for the scars of the past to rear their ugly heads as rusted metal weapons, scuffed hitiate and an abundance of skeletons littered the forest and let the explorers know that they were most likely headed in the right direction. What surprised everyone was the sheer number of skeletons and weapons that littered the jungle floor after nearly 25 years. The forest had filled in the craters and other signs of battle, but the bones were a constant reminder that this land had suffered a serious tragedy. After some encouragement from Sunad, Naruto began repeatedly casting the minor earth jutsu that was developed to bury people in the field. The earth repeatedly softened enough to swallow its intended contents before setting the contents to rest six feet underground where the remains would no longer be disturbed. Sunad began helping Naruto due to the sheer number of corpses and she really didn't want a bunch of skeletons remaining on the island if they ever decided to rebuild Azushio. The going was slow due to the repeated impromptu burials and the group ended up spending the first night camping out. The good thing about camping out with the Senjus was that Fuenjutsu made it infinitely more comfortable than it would otherwise be. At the crack of dawn, they resumed their exploration in a similar manner and were able to reach the ruins of Azushiogakor by midday. This was when Sunid and Naruto began to weep openly as they started noticing more and more Azuhishi 8. Rather than bury them independently, Naruto created a horde of shadow clones to gather the remains of his fallen family. He was going to lay their remains to rest together because family comes before all. After recovering and burying every Uzumaki and those loyal to Azushio, the Senju group finally focused on exploring the ruins. Most of the buildings were in tatters but a few remained untouched behind Uzumaki barriers that pulled off of the natural energy of the land. Naruto was able to get through these barriers after examining them for an hour or so and he was able to search five houses that belonged to branch family members of the Uzumaki clan. After searching those houses, Sunid guided Naruto toward where she remembered the Azukage tower was. Unlike the houses that were protected by barriers, it was clear that the barrier surrounding the Azukage tower was destroyed by overwhelming force. There was a circle of rubble that used to be a building and the devastation around the tower was never healed by nature. Naruto stepped into the tower and began looking around on the ground floor, which was the only remaining floor of the once great command center of the Uzumaki. M. Mama, is, is this all that is left? Naruto said despondently with tears trickling down his cheeks. Sunad wore a sad frown on her face as she placed a comforting hand on Naruto's shoulder, I don't know, kiddo. I am sure that this was the tower though. Naruto sniffled a bit, what about the main Uzumaki compound? Did you ever visit there? Yeah kiddo, it is up the hill a bit. The main branch was set up slightly outside of the village. Sunad answered softly. The group stepped out of the rubble and walked up the hill toward where Sunad remembered the Uzumaki's main house being. It was nearly a kilometer outside of the village on a hill that overlooked Azushio Gakor and Naruto could see why the clan wanted to live up here. It was beautiful and it offered a full view of the southern side of the island. He walked up the remains of a path until he saw a clearing just a clearing. Inside the mindscape, Rias was paying rapt attention and she wanted to help Naruto find any part of his ancestry that she could. Hey, 
Fox, tell the kid to turn on your eyes. If they went into full lockdown, then there will be more seals and stronger barriers protecting the important places. Kit, use my eyes again. Kurama said through the mind link. Look for any active seals and don't overlook anything. Naruto's eyes turned red with the black vertical slit as Naruto gained a new view of the old home of his ancestors. You're right, Q. There is so much going on I don't even know where to start though. Kurama saw the multiple barriers and protections that were erected around this clan compound. He let out a high-pitched whistle in appreciation of the Uzumaki's efforts in protecting their home. Well, Kit, that is a lot. Start from the outside and work your way in. Outside, Sunid and Shizun were exploring the invisible barriers that were preventing them from taking another step forward. Once again, Naruto pulled on Kurama's chakra and created 100 shadow clones that activated the Kitsune eyes and spread out to explore the clan compound. It took hours, then it took the full day and finally Naruto was able to crack the final blood seal that was protecting the compound shortly before the sun set. The final barrier seal was an Uzumaki blood seal combined with a Fuenjutsu puzzle that had to be completed. Naruto was sure that only an Uzumaki would be able to bypass such a seal. That wasn't even mentioning how all of these seals were connected to Senjutsu Chakra and powered themselves off the natural energy of the island. His clan were truly masters of the sealing arts. The Senju family was worn out from the long day of exploring and decided to sleep in the clan head's house that was positioned over a cliff with an overlook of the whole clan compound and village below. It was weird sleeping in the preserved home of his ancestors that looked like it was cleaned and maintained for the past 25 years. That being said, Naruto was more than ready to cuddle up into Sunid. The next day, Naruto explored the clan compound and that was where he found the wealth of Uzumaki knowledge. The clan head study had a space-time portal to the Uzumaki library and Naruto would later notice that a couple of these seals could be found scattered throughout Izushigako. The Uzumaki library was everything Naruto was hoping for and more. Sunid let Naruto and his clones copy as much as they could for the next two weeks, but she planned on leaving the original scrolls in the library. End of flashback. The second trip to Azushiogako went far more smoothly and they were able to pull into the old Uzumaki ports after Naruto hopped out and built some new docks using his Mokuten. The full training trip and Senju family as well as Haku, Tsunami, Kaisa, Anari, Kaito and Kiko, Tsunami and Kaisa's twin two-year-olds, York and Tazuna were along for the ride this time around. Wow, this place looks old. Anari offered his thoughts to the group as everyone was dismounting the ship. Kaisa ruffled Anari's hair, I have heard many a sailor talk about how great this city used to be. It is sad to see it like this. Naruto sighed sadly, yeah, I wish I could have seen it. Although, we will be sure to build it up bigger and better than ever. Damn straight kiddo. You have the super bridge builder and master craft extraordinaire here. Tazuna said proudly as he pulled on the ever-present white towel that was slung over his neck. Naruto belted out a laugh and Hikari chirped, old man, don't let the bridge go to your head. This city is going to be far harder to build and we need to make it even more awesome. Mama, when is Kinji supposed to be at the wave port? Naruto asked. Next week, Ruto. I will have you flash back there and then you can get them through the whirlpools. Sunad answered distracted as she once again soaked in the beauty and devastation of the village. All right everyone, let's get to the clan compounds and get set up. Naruto said in an attempt to take control of the F. Two weeks later, emergency. The time on a zoo was great for the Senju family. Every day felt like a productive day as Naruto worked with Kinji and the prospector to rebuild the key parts of the village infrastructure first. Without Mokuten, this part of the process would have taken many months, if not years. However, the legendary ability meant that Naruto could simply erect and adapt the building with his Mokuten, which meant Tazuna could immediately begin planning out the second level construction such as wiring and some standard seals that he was familiar with. Kinji's prospector was astounded at how quickly the new buildings were erected and he bumped up the timeline to open new Azu by a full year after the first week of watching Naruto work. Lord Senju, if you continue at this pace then we will be able to start moving farmers and other developers to the island shortly. Thanks, Saiso. I appreciate your help with this. What will be the most time-consuming part of that stage in the plan? Naruto asked. Deforestation and derooting. 
We will need to prepare some of the lands for harvest so that you don't have to import all of your food. Siso answered. Naruto Ed and Abro at Siso before turning to Kinji, Uncle Kin, has he never seen how we work? Has he ever worked with Shinobi? Kinji belted out a laugh loud enough to embarrass Kaori, who insisted on tagging along with her father and Madam Shijimi. Ho, 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 Siso just point out where you think it would be best for the farms to be built. This young man will have it done in a week. Siso looked incredulously at Naruto and then back at Kinji. Lord Daimyo, you can't be serious. Try us. Naruto said with a Y grin as he called his study group over. Oi, family, we have a challenge. We are going to use earth ninjutsu to prepare our new fields. Temari, wind to sever the trees. Make sure to keep them harvestable. Rias and Hikari, enough storage scrolls to encompass all of the wood of this forest. Gara and Sunad, we don't want to push the roots down, we want them out. Once that is done, we will need to till the soil and get it ready. Siso remained dubious despite the honored Senju family's attitude. That was until he dislocated his jaw four hours later after ten acres of forest were cleared in an afternoon and a newly tilled and prepared field was ready to go. Siso remained in a state of stunned disbelief until a laughing Kinji slapped him on the back after ten minutes of laughing uproariously. Lord Kinji, how come we don't do this in the land of fire? Siso whispered. Kinji adopted a thinking pose before answering, because old fools keep us stuck in the ways of the past. This isn't that half of what they can do either, Siso. That night, everyone was gathered together in the clan head's home, and they were playing cards while sipping on some sake after the kids were put to sleep. Everyone was cuddled up with their significant others, except Hikari and Yami, who decided to cuddle in sibling affection so as not to be left out. The night was going well until Naruto immediately sat up bolt straight and brought everyone's attention to him. I gotta go, Naruto said. What's wrong, brat? Sunad barked. Team 10's Horatian beacon was just activated. That means they are in trouble. Naruto shouted while he ran to put on his combat uniform. He would at least need his vest and jacket. Take us with you, Temari shouted. No, not until I know what is going on. Naruto shouted adamantly from his temporary room as he rushed to get into combat mode. Mama, set up a long-range Horatian beacon for me and be ready for wounded. Before anyone else could yell anything at him, they all saw a green and red flash come from the room Naruto was using. Ino whispered, be safe, Ruto. Ten minutes prior, Team 7 and Team 10 were in for a fight for their lives against two members of the Akatsuki in the middle of the, C, rank mission to Takagakor. They were just supposed to check in with the village and finish off a trade agreement before returning to Kanoa. As they were hanging out in the hotel and getting ready for an early night, sounds of battle and chaos began spreading around the city. Kakashi rushed out onto the hotel balcony and saw that there was a commotion at the front of the city, and he could see Taki Ninja scrambling to respond to it. That was when he heard an explosion and felt a surge of chakra coming from the great tree that was the cornerstone of Takagakor. He immediately ordered the teams to get their equipment on and remove all restrictive seals. Sensei, we have to go check on Fu. She is the only one that resides near the great tree. Shino insisted. Shino had been spending the past week getting to know Fu and she was practically royalty to a clan like the Abaraim. Kakashi, they are our allies and we have standing orders to combat the Akatsuki. Asuma added. Kakashi sighed before responding, All right, Asuma, you go and see if we can offer our support to the skirmish in the village. If they refuse your help, meet us at the lake in front of the great tree. Team 7, you are to remain in a support capacity until I call you into the fight. Shino, if Fu is incapacitated, you will be her protective detail. Sakura, you are medical and long-range support. Kiba and Akamaru, you will not engage unless I call for you. Shika, Chuji and Tayuya, you will come with me. We will only offer our support and get involved if Taki requests it. We cannot force our way into the fight while in an allied village. Asuma barked as he released his seals and prepared his trench knives. Team 7 arrived at the battlegrounds near the Great Tree around 7 minutes after hearing the first alarm. During their travels, Kakashi and Shino felt the release of Biju Chakra, which pretty much confirmed their worst fears. Kakashi had his team hang back until he could analyze the threat, and things weren't looking good. 
Team 7 arrived to see a big man and some monstrosity of a creature standing over a mint-haired girl who was clearly badly injured. Shino, you are in charge. I will try to separate him from Fu. Use your bugs to aid me. Kakashi ordered. Kakashi opened the engagement with a volley of lighting encased kunai that forced the enemy shinobi to dodge to the side, which at least took his foot off of the Jinchuriki's chest. Kakashi followed up the kunai with a close quarters engagement with the Akitsuki member. As he closed the distance, he lifted his Hishiate and brought his Sharingan into the fight early on. Kakazu turned and met the new threat head-on with his, Iwa style, diamond armor, which made his body super hard and to increase his offense and defense. The engagement was quick, fast, dirty and quite one-sided. Everything Kakashi threw at Kakazu seemed to bounce right off of him and it took Kakashi a severe blow to his chest to realize that his opponent was using earth jutsu to harden his skin. Kakashi had fought enough shinobi from Iwa to realize an earth-style reinforcement jutsu and he immediately changed tactics. He recovered from the blow, encased his kunai in a potent lightning chakra and re-engaged his opponent. Team 7 watched on and they were scared to see Kakashi failing to land a decisive blow on his opponent. As that fight dragged on, they were forced to deal with a creature that seemed to be made of a bunch of black threads and it wore a mask that bore the kanji for fire. The original attack from the creature caught them by surprise and the only reason they survived the surprise fireball was a quick, earth-style, mud wall, from Shino. That didn't stop the creature from ramming into Kiba, which sent him sprawling. Shino reacted immediately by unleashing his Kikaichu and Biju bugs to launch his initial onslaught on the intimidating creature. He also pulsed Chakra into the lid of his Senjutsu beetles and prepared to set up the battlefield to deal with this new opponent. Luckily, Kiba was made of tough stuff, and he was able to shake off the tackle from the tentacled and masked creature. He recovered quickly and easily determined that he would need his Inazuka food pills and threw one to his partner as well. Team 7's teamwork was shaky at best, but Shino did his best to respond to the evolving battlefield and he played defense for his frontline teammate. That being said, the masked creature's body was iron hard, and it was able to withstand multiple hits from the Gatshuga attack. The creature also withstood the explosions from his Biju bugs, and it was able to burn the Kikaichu he had released. This told Shino that the body was not the way to go as he erected yet another mud wall to protect Kiba from the creature's flames. It was at that time that the lid to his gourd clicked open and he was able to call upon his Senjutsu beetles. He felt the communication link with Chiketa open up and he quickly informed her and the hive of his recent discoveries on their opponent. With a new plan in mind, Shino locked the creature in an earth-style earthen coffin, which was just four earth walls erected close together around the opponent. Kiba, fall back and recover. Sakura, tend to him. I have a plan. Shino shouted to his teammates. Kakashi was having a rough time against a clearly superior opponent. So far, Kakashi recognized his opponent as Kakazu the Immortal, and he had briefly recalled his opponent's known abilities. However, knowing your opponent's abilities doesn't make it that much easier to counter them when your opponent displays mastery over four elements. Thus, Kakashi was fighting a defensive battle to buy time for his team to deal with the creature that was attacking them. Shino used the 10 seconds his earth and coffin bought the team to tell them his plan and he could only pray it worked. Sakura didn't bring anything to the fight and Kiba would need far more accuracy if he was going to land a decisive blow on the mask. Therefore, Shino's plan revolved around him and his new senjutsu beetles that had spread out around the coffin. Team 7 saw a red glow from within the coffin and a second later the coffin exploded outward in a forceful display of fire and earth shrapnel. Kiba trusted Shino and he listened to the guy's plan. Therefore, he led the renewed assault with a fang over fang, with a kamaru, which failed once more, before Kiba jumped back and created distance. The Inazuka attack kept the creature in one place when it was assaulted from all sides by football-sized beetles that were flying at high speeds. The creature attempted an area of effect fire attack, but that didn't stop the horde of airborne beetles that were now locked onto their target. The hardened pincers of the beetles tore into the creature and two beetles were able to tunnel through the mask. After the beetles attack, the creature let out a screech before the thread suddenly untangled and fell limply onto the ground. Team 7's minor victory was overshadowed by a scream from Kakashi. In that moment, Shino made the call and ran forward to assist his sensei. Sakura, use the Horatian beacon, now. 
Shino shouted over his shoulder as he ran to back up his sensei. Naruto arrived at a chaotic fight and the immediate influx of negative emotions was overwhelming to the Senju air that was in sage mode. He sensed an ongoing fight near him and pandemonium in the village. He decided to focus on Team 7 since they were the ones that called for support. Naruto created 10 clones to scout the area and then immediately headed towards the biggest chakra signature. Naruto arrived to see Shino being held aloft by multiple black threads in front of a man that Naruto immediately recognized. Shino's arms were impaled, and Naruto flashed back to memories of Kakazu trying to rip out his opponent's hearts to replenish his own. With a thought to Kurama, Naruto flickered into KSM1 mode and disappeared in a golden blur towards Kakazu. Naruto was so fast that he caught the so-called immortal off guard as a katana encased in copious amounts of wind chakra cut and upward slash through the black tentacles that were threatening his friend. After severing the tentacles, Naruto levied a knee to Kakazu's hardened gut before Naruto spun on his plant foot and used his right foot to lash out in a bone-crunching side kick. Kakazu went flying off into the distance and Naruto used the time that brought him to take stock of the current situation. Kakashi was lying 10 feet away with burns on his right arm and an earth spike through his left shoulder. Shino was crawling on the ground completely incapacitated due to the injuries to all four limbs. Akamaru was whimpering in pain and distress as he licked Kiba's unconscious face. Sakura had crumpled to her knees, but she didn't look to be in immediate danger. It was then that Naruto noticed Fu's crumpled form lying over a puddle of blood. Naruto formed five wood clones and fed enough of Kurama's chakra into the clones for them to make the jump to Azu. Naruto knew that the Horatian put stress on the target's body, but that would have to do for now because they were each in critical condition and Naruto knew four great medics that were back in Azushiogakure right now. As Naruto saw Kakazu walking towards him, his clones grabbed all of the wounded and disappeared in flashes of golden light. I should have known you would be with the Kanoa brats, QB Jinchuriki. I am in a rather foul mood, and I am in need of a heart. I advise you to scurry away, brat. You are way out of your league. Kakazu growled. Naruto laughed heartily in his best imitation of Hashirama. Ho, 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 Kakazu the so-called immortal doesn't want a rematch. That is a shame because my grandfather should have ended you instead of pitying you. Kakazu's growl deepened. Oh, please, brat. Just because you caught a bunch of Iwa and sound chumps off guard doesn't mean you can step into Hashirama's shoes. Naruto's laughter ceased and a serious look found its way onto his face. No, Kakazu, you are wrong. Your little band of merry men doesn't know what they are up against, so let me show you how futile your efforts are. Before Kakazu could answer the brat's outrageous statement, he felt an overwhelming aura and power settled upon his shoulders and his eyes widened. Then, all hell broke loose and Kakazu felt fear for the first time in 85 years. Kakazu watched the golden form of the QB Jinchuriki become enshrouded in a wooden armor and Kakazu saw four chakra chains emerge from the back of the golden cloak. In a golden blur, Kakuza felt pain lance through his arm that blocked the blow as he was sent flying 10 meters. As Kakazu was recovering, he missed the chain that was lanced through his right arm, and he was pulled toward Naruto. As Naruto yanked the chain back, he also dashed forward with his three remaining chains held out in front of him in a triangular trident form. Naruto heard and felt three squelches before he launched a Mokuten gauntlet at Kakazu's face. The Akatsuki member was flown backward as chains ripped out of his body due to its sudden change in momentum. That one attack had taken out two of the masks he wore and narrowly missed a third mask. That meant that Kakazu was unconscious for most of the flight, and it took a second after impact for his new heart to get into place and restore movement to his shattered and torn body. Kakazu was a proud man that had lived for a long time. He was alive during the times of Hashirama, and he witnessed the prowess of the Mokuten firsthand. It was that retreat that led to his village's betrayal, which led to him spending years in prison before becoming a missing ninja. After his village's betrayal, Kakazu only believed in two things, money and power. If the money was good enough, then he would commit himself to any mission that his power could handle. Kakazu was a firm believer in not signing checks that your body can't cash, and he instinctively knew that his body couldn't cash this particular check. As one of his two remaining hearts slid into place, Kakazu immediately decided to retreat. He hoped the QB brat would go to the village rather than chase him down. 
he would live to fight another day and he needed to notify the organization of the kid's power. Therefore, Kakazu put his sizable chakra to work and performed a long-range shunshun that got him the F out of dodge. Naruto felt Kakazu leave Takagakor and he was torn between giving chase to him and going to help in the village. He couldn't sustain KSM-1 for long and he decided to drop the chakra cloak before he burnt out his tenkatsu. He should be able to make do with sage mode so he spread his senses into the village to get an understanding of what was going on there. His decision to abandon Kakazu was made for him when he identified the sinister chakra of hidden the Jashinist and he simultaneously felt the weakening chakra signature of a friend. He locked onto the beacon that he knew Team 10 would be carrying and disappeared in a green flash. Naruto arrived to see the crazy Jashinist in the middle of his ritual and Asuma Sarutobi was once again on the receiving end. Naruto saw Shikamaru struggling to hold the Jashinist from plunging the spiked rod into his heart. Shika was bleeding profusely from a wound on his side and Naruto could tell that he couldn't hold on much longer. For as much as he changed the timeline, some things insisted on staying the same. However, Naruto was not going to let this go down like last time. Naruto whipped out a three-pronged kunai and tossed it at the Jashinist. As the kunai approached Hidden's left ear, Naruto appeared in a greed flash and tackled the crazy F out of his ritual circle. Naruto remembered Shikamaru talking about one of the most traumatic events of his past life and he remembered the analytical breakdown that Shikamaru gave. Any damage done to Hidden in the ritual circle would also be done to the individual linked to Hidden's blood ritual. Therefore, Naruto settled with a firm, yet not overly damaging, tackle. The result was Hidden flying out of the circle, which made his markings disappear. It also let Asuma Sarutobi crumble to the ground where Chuji immediately took up a defensive position around him. Naruto never got to fight the insane fanatic of Jashin last time around. However, Naruto did notice the change in the guy's appearance, and he assumed that would mean that he is no longer linked to the ritual. Therefore, he decided to not risk anything, and he let loose nine Mokuten chains that impaled the man as Naruto recovered from the tumble to the ground. While Naruto would normally prefer to enjoy the fight, he had multiple hurt friends and allies that were in a critical situation, which forced his hand into ending the battle quickly. As Naruto hoisted the Jashinist up with his chains, he noticed that the religious fanatic genuinely shrugged off the pain of three chains in his gut and one chain in each limb. It was truly an amazing sight to see when the crazy kept spouting off at the mouth. Oi, would you shut up the fanatical? Our sensei is in critical condition over here and Shika is up too. Tayuya shouted. That snapped Naruto out of it, so Naruto unsealed Benihim and walked calmly toward the immobilized Jashinist. Hidden saw this and kept spouting off at the mouth. Oi, QB brat, what gives you the right to interrupt my sacrifices to Lord Jashin? Put me down. I need to honor Lord Jashin more. Hidden of the Akatsuki, for your crimes against the people of Takagakor and my friends, I, Naruto Senju Uzumaki, sentence you to death. Naruto said in an icy calm. Shut the F up you ignorant child. I am immortal thanks to the glory of Lord Jashin. Hidden shouted. Then I will put your immortality to the test. Naruto replied in an icy calm as he sent a wind blade from Benihim that severed the immobilized man's head. As Hidden's head clattered to the ground, he continued shouting. See? Mother F, I am immortal. Hidden shouted and cackled insanely. His cackling ceased when a wood clone grabbed Hidden by his hair and the Jashinist watched as his body was shredded to pieces by Naruto's chakra chains. Naruto ed an eyebrow at the Jashinist before he walked over to his clone holding the head. Any last words? Oh mighty immortal. F you, Hidden. Hidden shrieked before attempting to bite Naruto. Naruto nodded to his clone who put a glowing blue hand on Hidden's head. Kanji and thick black lines spread out over the head and the screaming ceased immediately. Naruto then turned to the remains of Hidden and sealed them in a scroll before he casually tossed the scroll into the air and burned it unceremoniously. Naruto then got on eye level with the head of the Jashinist that was looking at him with eyes wide in horror. Look here, you crazy religious F. I don't care what god you worship. They won't protect you from me. Now, Let's see if you can survive a storage scroll with no oxygen, no light and no hope of escape. Naruto hissed in a whisper before he began writing on a scroll that he removed from his Fuinjutsu kit. A moment after Naruto sealed the head away, shouts of Grodd erupted from Shinobi around the combat zone and Team 10 sighed in relief. 
Naruto ignored them and walked over to Asuma, who really was in a bad condition. Naruto reached down and applied a stasis seal over Asuma before he reached into his pouch and pulled out a medical stasis scroll. He had Chuji lay Asuma onto the stasis scroll before Asuma puffed away in a wisp of chakra smoke. All right guys, I can get him to Sunid. That scroll buys me 24 hours. Shika, what happened to you? Naruto asked with concern as he turned to his friend whose flak jacket and combat shirt were torn and saturated with blood. Shikamaru winced as he raised his arm to give Naruto a better look. That crazy guy got me with his scythe. Asuma-sensei immediately tried to stop him from doing his ritual on me and was injured during that attack. That guy got one drop of his blood then began laying into him with that blood ritual. I finally got him with my shadow and then you showed up. Yeah, that crazy wouldn't stop spouting off like a stupid religious, but when my doki hit him, it only hurt Asuma-sensei. Tayuya added. Naruto ed an eyebrow at Tayuya, is that so? And when did you get out on good behavior? Chuji stepped in, Naruto, now is not the best time. How are we going to get Asuma to a hospital? Naruto put a calming hand on the panicking Chuji's shoulder, relax, big man, I will take you out the same way I came in. Before I do that, I need to talk to Taki's representative though. It looks like they took a hit. At that moment, a formation of Taki Shinobi came forward with a man dressed in a dark blue kimono at the front. Lord Senju, we are most grateful for your help, but I would like to know how you got into my village. Naruto turned on professional mode and turned to address the newcomers. My compatriots called in for emergency support. Forgive me for not telling you exactly how, but if you know my father then you should be able to understand. May I ask who I am speaking with? The man bowed, ah, yes, how rude of me. I am Shibuki, the elected leader of this village. I will forego my inquisition since we are indebted to you. Naruto nodded, very well, Lord Shibuki, I have a critically injured team member and one that needs immediate medical attention. I do not know what mission they were on, but may I suggest we postpone it to a later date. Very well, Lord Senju. Before you go, were you involved in the battle at the Great Tree? Naruto sighed, guessing what information he wanted, but he didn't want to tell him. Yes, I fought of Kakazu, you guys should be familiar with him. He severely injured Team 7 and they were the ones that called me in for emergency support. Kakazu fled and I sensed the ongoing battle here and decided to come aid my comrades. Can you tell me more about that fight? I have yet to send a team over to investigate. Shibuki asked in a meek and pitiful manner. Lord Shibuki, as I have stated, I have critically injured, and I need to evacuate them. If you have an issue, please take it up with the Hockage through the proper channels at a different time. For now, I need to ensure the safety of my teams that helped you voluntarily. Naruto replied forcefully. Very well, you may take your leave. Shibuki said with a curt bow. Hey, Q, do I have enough juice left to go into KSM again and flash to Azu? Naruto thought. Yeah, Kit, we can do that. We will need to rest tomorrow though. Kurama replied. Okay, Team 10, gather around and place a hand on me. Naruto said out loud to his friends. What the F would I touch your admittedly SA for? Tayuya asked. Tayuya, do as he says. Now, Shikamaru said forcefully, which cowed the new addition to Team 10. As Team 10 placed their hands upon Naruto, he ignited into his KSM mode, took 10 seconds to feel out the Horatian beacon in a zoo and then disappeared along with Team 10 in a golden flash. They left a burning village and a bunch of dumbstruck Taki Shinobi in their wake. Team 10 arrived in a bustling house as soon as was shouting and coordinating Ino, Hanata, Haku and Shizun while they provided medical treatments to the injured Kanoa Shinobi. Naruto handed off Shikamaru to Shizun and called out to Sunid, Mama, I need to talk to you outside. I am kinda busy, brat. Sunid said agitatedly. It is important, Mama. Naruto insisted. Sunid relented and followed Naruto out onto the porch. What is it, brat? Naruto held up a stasis scroll, and Sunid's eyes widened. I have Asuma Sensei in here. From what I saw, he had damage to both legs and at least two puncture wounds through the abdomen. There was also a punctured lung. I cannot flash any more right now, and I wanted to know if you want to handle him here or if we should wait to take him to wave. Sunid thought about it for a bit, I know you probably didn't have time, but where were the wounds? 
right kidney and spleen. The other was probably along the large intestine. The right lung and my best guess imply that it was full of blood and collapsed. The leg wounds weren't spurting so most likely flesh wound, but it was from that hidden freak. Naruto answered thoughtfully. Okay, keep him in the scroll. Naruto, you need to know something. Naruto looked expectantly at Sunid. Fu isn't going to make it. Her wounds aren't healing, and Shomai's chakra is already starting to leak out. I heard Kakazu was there, and his threads pierced Fu's heart and primary chakra core. By the time she got here, the damage to the heart was too extensive. Shomai's chakra is the only thing keeping her alive right now. F. Naruto shouted and punched the railing of the deck, which disintegrated into splinters from the sudden blow. Sunid put a comforting hand on his shoulder, look, kiddo, go talk to her, or at least Shomei, and try to do what good you can. Naruto sighed and fell into Sunid's embrace, damn it, mama. This wasn't supposed to happen like this. Sunid squeezed him passionately, we do the best we can, kiddo. Remember, we can't save everyone. It is not our job to save everyone. We just do the best we can for as many as we can. Naruto grunted before an idea came to him. He bit his thumb and weaved through hand signs before saying, summoning Jutsu, Shuna the Divine Priestess. Shuna appeared in all her regal beauty, and she listened to Naruto. She went with Sunid into the room and took a look at Fu. After ten minutes, the two exited the room with somber looks on their faces. Thanks for trying, Shuna. It was a desperation move. Naruto said softly. It is quite all right, Naruto. I have come to enjoy this world and I treasure your family. Now, Lady Sunid, is there anything I can do for the other injured? Sunid grunted and led Shuna into the impromptu medical bay. After the two left, Naruto entered the room Fu was in and saw her crumpled form lying on the mattress. Her wounds had been dressed up, but there was nothing you can do for a wound to the heart that took out the chakra core. He sighed as he knelt at Fu's bedside. He noticed her diminished vital signs and came to the unpleasant conclusion that he couldn't help her. After a resigned sigh, he weaved through some hand seals and placed a tender hand over Fu's heart. He watched the kanji spread over the area as a thin blue glow encompassed her body and her whole being seemed to still. He asked for help from Kurama before he placed his hand over her seal on her exposed abdomen. Okay, Q, that stasis seal will buy us some time and slow the damage, but we are on a clock. We need to talk to Chomei, and I have a feeling based on the desperate feeling of Chomei's chakra that she isn't going to want to leave. Kurama was pacing in the mindscape, it was an uncomfortable sensation for him, and he didn't enjoy seeing this human die. He remembered that Fu was one of the first Biju captured and he remembered Chomei telling him about her life experience when the Biju were released and in hiding. He was racking his brain and trying to come up with a way to save the human girl, but if Sunid couldn't do it then Kurama couldn't think of anything he could do. With a resigned sigh, Kurama answered his host. Look, Kit, Chomei was attached to this container. I will take you in there but try to let me do the talking. Kurama said in a somber tone. All right, I trust you. Naruto responded before he calmed his mind and placed his hands on Fu seal. A familiar diving sensation washed over Naruto's senses and Naruto opened his eyes to see a replication of the great tree of Takakakura and the lake that resided near it. He saw the giant insect form of Chomei hovering over a motionless body by the lakeside of the mindscape. The beetle was speaking frantically and jittering its pincers in an agitated fashion as its wings beat just fast enough for it to hover over the girl. The biju was so distressed that it didn't notice its guests. Chomei, sister, we need to talk. Kurama said in a soft tone to garner Chomai's attention. Chomei spun around midair and took up a defensive position over Fu. Kurama, what have you done to my container? Why is this boy here with you? Kurama sat on his haunches in a non-aggressive pose as his tails waved in a forced calm behind him. Sister, we have put a stasis seal over your container's wound so that we would have time to talk and come to a resolution. We have brought her to the best medic in the elemental nations and, and. Spit it out, Kurama. Will Fu recover? Chomei shouted agitatedly. Kurama hung his head and spoke softly, no, sister, the damage to her heart was too severe. Chomei buzzed about in a distressed fashion and the feelings overwhelmed Naruto. He focused on linking with his body and accessing the Senjutsu Chakra. 
He entered sage mode within the mindscape and focused on spreading the calmed nature energy through the seal and into Chomei. Chomai's agitation and anger became subdued, and it sounded like the giant insect was mourning the news, but the calming presence of Naruto was helping her think rationally. Chomei, I am sorry I didn't arrive fast enough to save Fu. I wasn't called to Taki until her fight was over and there was so much going on. I am Naruto Senju Uzumaki, and I want to help you. Naruto stepped forward slowly with his hands up and open in front of his chest. Chomei turned toward Kurama, how does your jailer know my name? Why does he feel like the one that first enslaved us? Kurama watched Naruto do his thing and he decided to assist his container by answering the questions. Naruto has the Mokuten ability, and he is a descendant of that man. He knows your name from a variety of sources, but the main reason is because he saved you and earned your trust in a previous life. Naruto stopped his approach and turned toward Kurama, way to go, Q, just pop the time travel bubble right away. Naruto's tone was playful and sarcastic, which was a startling and abrupt change from his calm demeanor a second earlier. Chomai's eyes locked onto Naruto and Kurama in a state of stunned disbelief. This night was too overwhelming for Chomei, and it was starting to become too much to bear. Don't play with me, brother. Chomei spat. Kurama's eye narrowed and his gaze hardened upon Chomei, look here, little sister, I have come to your domain to speak with you and help you on behalf of this human here. We do not deceive you and if you disrespect me again, I will show you why I am the strongest of the Biju. Now, stop your incessant hovering and clicking and listen to my partner. This startled Chomei, especially the overwhelming power of Kurama's aura that he just flexed in front of her. The words had the desired effect as Chomei became more subdued and she landed in front of Fu. Naruto walked forward calmly toward Chomei and extended a fist to the beetle. With hesitation, Chomei extended a leg toward the tiny human and tapped his fist. A flood of memories hit Chomei and they were all centered around this boy's interactions with her in another time and place. Chomei saw how the boy had met Fu before and the two became fast friends, at least until she fell into the hands of the Akatsuki. Chomei saw Naruto break Obito's control over her and the many conversations that Naruto had with her and the other Biju. She saw how Naruto did everything he could to protect the tailed beasts and shelter them from the greed of the humans. Then she saw the end. As Chomei was reviewing the memories, she was suddenly hit with a wave of sadness and grief from the human boy. It became clear to Chomei that the child was watching the memories with her, and it opened up old wounds for the child. Chomei saw Naruto drop his fist before he approached Fu and calmed some of her tousled hair before he erected a wooden bed for her to rest in. Chomei was overwhelmed by the sense of grief and regret as the human child looked at her current container. Chomei forcibly snapped her attention away from the human child and looked towards her brother, how is this possible? Kurama sighed as he lay his head on his paws. The Juubi was released upon the human world and ended that timeline. Kami sent us back to start the new cycle. We have done everything we can to prevent the tragic end, but my kit is only one man. Chomei was forced to stomach that information and her attention reverted to Naruto once more. Amid the rampaging sensations of regret and grief, the human child offered a sense of peace and understanding with his chakra. Why have you come here, boy? Naruto tore his attention away from Fu's motionless form and looked up at Chomei, because I want to save you the pain of dying and reforming. I want to offer you a temporary sanctuary in my seal. I did a similar thing with Kokuo, but I had to absorb his natural energy after he had died and while he was reforming. Chomei clicked her massive pincers in agitation, so, you wish for my power. You wish to be my new jailer. Kurama slapped a tail on the lake and a tidal wave of water splashed into the distant lands of the mindscape, Chomei, my kit wishes nothing of the sort. If you would rather die and reform, he will let you. I would advise otherwise. Kurama spoke in a growl, he really hated it when people improperly judged his partner. Naruto held up a calming hand to Kurama, I will tell you what I told Kokuo. I am good in the power department and there is a good chance that you will send my chakra out of whack and actually make me weaker for a time. What I am offering you is a choice, Chomei. You can fly around after you reform waiting for humans to attack you and attempt to enslave you. That would be your choice if you remain in Fu. Chomei started stamping her chitinous legs in disgust. Or you can come with me where I will let you choose your partner. 
I will construct the seal in a manner that will let you be released, or at least a part of you. Whoever you choose will work with you toward a true partnership, as the sage intended from the start. Chomai's buzzing and stomping stopped, and you can't save Fu. Naruto's gaze fell and he shook his head, no, I am sorry I wasn't there sooner. Kurama decided to step in here, sister, we have stabilized her in a manner that will give you a couple days to decide. Your container will remain unconscious my kit is tired, and he needs to rest. Think about our offer and we will return tomorrow. As Naruto left Fu's room and re-entered the craziness of the impromptu medical bay, Naruto was flagged over by Kinji. The two walked out onto the porch away from the craziness. The emotional stress of the evening and the considerable chakra drain was starting to take its toll on Naruto. His eyes were dimmer, his face was fixed into a serious frown and his skin seemed paler. All of this was noticed by Kinji, and the daimyo was worried about the boy he considered family. Ruto, I know you have had a long night and I won't take much of your time. I have notified Itachi of what happened, and a medical team is being dispatched to Wave. He told me that he would handle Taki, but I didn't tell him about the girl. Kinji said softly. Naruto chuckled dryly, so, you figured that out, huh? Kinji nodded slowly, yeah, bud, I did. What did you do in her room? I spoke with Chome and let her know that there was nothing more we could do for Fu. And what is your plan? Kinji prodded softly. Same thing I did with Kokuo. Uncle Kin, you should know I don't give a damn about the balance of power or any of that nonsense. I will free the Biju, or at the very least let them choose their own partners. Kinji nodded once more, yes, I figured that. Well, the way I see it, you brought Fu to Sunid because she is the best doctor in the elemental nations. We will need to return Fu's body to Takagakor, but they don't need to know what happened with Chome. Naruto growled lowly, they will not give her the respectful burial she deserves. That town never loved nor appreciated her. Can you push for the rights to bury her in a place of Chomai's choosing? Kinji sighed, I will see what I can do, kiddo. Kinji pulled Naruto into a warm hug. You have done so much good for the world, Naruto. I know this hurts, I know this is a setback, but don't let it sway your path. Naruto wrapped his arms around Kinji and returned the hug, thanks Uncle Kin. I won't, I am just tired and stressed. Then trust me and your mama to handle everything else for the night. Go get some rest away from all of this craziness, Kinji said with finality. As Naruto left the compound and went to rest in one of the other homes that wasn't destroyed, the Uzumaki clan head's house remained in a state of chaos, stress and worry for the night. Sunad, Shizun, Hanata, Haku and Ino worked through the night with the minimal supplies they had to stabilize Kakashi, Shino, Kiba and Shikamaru. Luckily for them, their injuries weren't fatal, and Sunad and her apprentices were able to see them through the long night. Three days later, Itachi and Team Rowan were let into Azushiogakor by Naruto. The communication scrolls made it easy for Naruto to know when to disable the whirlpool defenses and the Kanoa group made it onto the island. The Kanoa group brought a whole medical suite worth of supplies for the injured patients and Sunid finally had what she needed to patch Asuma up. Naruto unsealed Asuma from his third medical stasis scroll and laid him out on the medical bed that the Kanoa team brought. Sunid had already used her jutsu so set up a sterile field in the room and Shinzun and Hanata were ready to assist Sunid in the surgery. Sunid visibly winced when she saw the state Asuma was in, and Naruto left the surgical room to let Sunid work her magic. Outside of the surgical room, Itachi and Kinji were waiting for Naruto. The trio walked to an empty room and erected a privacy barrier. There was an awkward silence, nobody knowing exactly where to start, and it was then that Naruto that spoke up. Atachi, before we have this conversation, I need to know if you trust me. Atachi had an eyebrow and observed how serious Naruto was. He nodded his head slightly, you know I trust you, Naruto. What is it? Naruto looked to Kinji before nodding to himself, well, Lord Hockage, I need you to sign an Uzumaki blood contract not to reveal any information we discuss here with the council or Kanoa or anybody not approved by me or Lord Kinji. Atachi once again looked to Kinji and saw that the Daimyo's face matched the deadly serious attitude of Naruto. With a resigned sigh, Atachi replied, very well. Kinji spoke up, Atachi, this is serious. Far more serious than any village or nation. 
If this information gets out, it could and would ignite the Fourth Great Shinobi War. Atachi hesitated for a minute and then threw his hands up in exasperation, Holy Kami, Naruto. Is there anything you do that isn't life-changing or world-shattering? Naruto laughed heartily at that, Atachi, I am here to change the world. I am here to lead the shinobi world into a new and better cycle. So, blood contract. Atachi nodded once more. I am not the Sandaim. I will choose to trust you. Before we get to that, I need to tell you something. Atachi seemed disappointed and apprehensive now, they were small tells but Naruto knew Atachi well. I am listening, sensei. Atachi sighed, a month ago, shortly after the incident in Wave, Kuritsuki was taken from the political prison that we had her in. There were no deaths, no broken locks, no evidence, no nothing except a ping from the barrier core. By the time the Anbu responded, Kuritsuki was gone. F. Naruto said as he attempted to stop himself from punching the wall. Kinji noticed something, you know who did it. Naruto nodded, it is the shadow of the Akatsuki. It is the Uchiha that put the fourth Mizukage under his control and caused the bloodline purges. And it is the Uchiha that controlled Kurama and made him attack Kanoa. He has a space-time ability that lets him warp in and out of places. That is what my father told me about when I was younger, and I have protected all of my homes with seals resistant to his space-time ability. S. Kinji whispered under his breath. That's not good. Whispered Atachi under his breath. I will need you to install those seals all over Kanoa, at least in all of the important places. The Anbu aren't going to like that. Naruto said with a chuckle. At Atachi's Ed eyebrow, he explained. I can key my chakra signature as an exception to the barrier. I cannot do that for everyone else. That means, in those zones, they will not be able to use Shunshin or other techniques that manipulate space. Atachi sighed, they will have to deal with it. Moving on, Atachi, how are the reforms going? Kinji asked. Atachi rubbed his eyes, your wife has helped calm the civilian population. The shinobi clans have spread the Senju's contribution to Kanoa and converted most of the populace. The civilian council is disbanded, and we lost a few merchants because of that. What of Homura, Koharu and the old monkey? Naruto asked pointedly. With the help of Kinji, I revoked their rights to be in the council. They are truly forced into retirement now. I am working with the new Yutatane and Mitokoto clan heads to ensure that they understand the current situation. They are suffering from severe ostracization of the main shinobi clans. Naruto nodded, pleased to hear some good news. Kinji spoke up, you have done good, Atachi. By the end of the training trip things should be settled enough for the Senjus to settle down for a bit. Atachi offered a sincere smile, that was the point of all of this. Now, can we get back to the contract and the information you are so protective of? Naruto wrote up the contract and all three parties signed it. That was when Atachi found out about what Naruto did with Kokuo and what he planned to do with Chome. Part of the contract was Atachi swearing to never release this information or attempt to use the Biju as an asset of Kanoa. In short, Kokuo and Chome didn't belong to Kanoa, even if Atachi could give missions to their Jinchuriki. The biggest stipulation was that Atachi could not and would not inform anyone on the Kanoa Council of the Biju's status. Naruto informed Atachi on how this would have dire consequences with the Akatsuki and Naruto's plans for the organization and the Biju. In return, Naruto swore to never use the Biju to dominate, terrorize or conquer any part of the elemental nations. He was also forced to sign saying that he would return to Kanoa until at least his 21st birthday. All Naruto wanted to do was protect the beings he had grown to consider family by proxy to Kurama. Elsewhere on the island, Tayuya and Yami were walking through the ruins of Azu. They had spoken multiple times over the past couple days and Yami felt strangely drawn to the foulmouthed beauty. Of the altars, Yami had the strongest link to negative emotions and the mixing of Tayuya's beauty and eccentricity with her darker side truly intrigued Yami to no end. For Tayuya, she felt like Yami understood her and she wanted to understand more about him. It was clear to her that the bee had mellowed out a bit and she wanted to find out about that. This if creepy, Tayuya said as she stepped over some rubble in the center of the ruins. It is like walking in a flippin' graveyard and I am just waiting for some ghost to jump up and scare my A. Yami cast an amused smile at the girl, this is our home, and a great injustice was done here. 
Believe it or not, the negative energy has subsided quite a bit since the first time Naruto came here. Tayo your head and eyebrow at Yami, care to explain that a little more, emo f. Yami scowled, I get your foul mouth, but that nickname sucked. Tayuya threw her hands up in mock apology, so Yami continued. When Naruto first arrived, nobody was buried. The invaders didn't take the dead or anything, so there were tens of thousands of bodies scattered on the island. No s. Tayuya said surprised. No s. The Uzumaki forces numbered just over 5,000 and they fought off nearly 75,000 invaders. If it weren't for the four Jinchuriki of Iwa, Kumo and Kiri then the Uzumaki would have likely succeeded in defending their home. In the end, less than 5,000 of the invading forces left the island. Yami spoke reverently about the feats of his ancestors. He resonated deeply with his home country and all of the lingering emotions in the air. Tayuya whistled appreciatively, sounds like the Uzumaki was some seriously badass mother f. Yami chuckled, yes, yes, they were. Now, all we want to do is rebuild our home country and honor our ancestors. Naruto is the rightful daimyo of these lands and that is why we are here. Yeah, your brother. You call him a brother, right? Yami nodded while moving through the ruins. Yeah, well that guy is a badass just like these Uzumakis. We were fighting against that immortal worshipper of Jashin and we couldn't do anything I guess that is the second time he saved me. She finished in a whisper. Yami smiled again, yeah, that is what he does. And you used to be synced with him, right? Yeah. Are you going to, sync, with him again? No. Why not? Tayuya asked, curious about this guy. Because neither of us want that. Over the past year and change, I have changed, he has changed, and we all have changed. We cannot be separated from one another, but it would also be equally as damaging to force us into one. Yami said pensively. That was some deep s for an emo bastard. Tayuya ribbed him, breaking the serious mood. Yeah, well, I guess you could say I respect him. He is teaching me that there is a purpose in overcoming all the terrible f in this world. Not only is he teaching me, but he is out there showing me how to do it. Then I get the chance to get to know people like you, the people he saved and changed. Yami said wistfully. And, Tayuya pressed. And it gives me a purpose to keep on living. It gives me hope that I can change and find my purpose. Yami answered sincerely. Look, emo boy, I like you the way you are. The world doesn't need another F super boy scout. Tayuya said earnestly. Yami paused mid-step. You mean that? You like me? Tayuya nodded, not willing to say it out loud again. Can I K you? Tayuya jumped back and exclaimed, what are you emo? Yami held up his hand defensively. I am sorry for asking. Tayuya's blush calmed, and she decided to ask, why did you ask me that? Yami looked down at the ground and an uncertain look fixed itself on his face. In order to help me, the others have shared memories with me. I watched as they fell in love, I watched them k and grow closer. It filled me with a temporary happiness, and I wanted to feel that more than anything. However, it felt like watching a movie. Like the feelings weren't my own. Tayuya stepped forward, grabbed Yami's head on both sides and stepped up on her tippy toes to place a passionate K on his lips. It was impulsive, it was brash, it was rushed, and it was sloppy, but it was Yami's first K. Tayuya released Yami's head and stepped back a bit. She laughed uproariously at the blush on Yami's face and the fixed, stunned look he was wearing. It is just a K, emo boy. Tayuya forced herself to play down her own feelings. This guy was crazy, creepy and emotional. Just as f up and broken as she was, which is probably why she did it. Thank you. Yami said as he broke out of his stunned state and a smile fixed itself upon his face. Sure thing, f. Keep playing your cards right and there may be more where that came from. Tayuya answered softly. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.